Thank you, Alan. That was a terrific setup for um, where we go next um, with our conference for the day. And, and uh, it's really helpful to have Alan, I think, lay out those four points. Um, let me uh, just go ahead and jump to our keynote speaker, Mike Osterholm. Um, for anybody who's been in this field, uh, really is not somebody who needs much of an introduction. I'll, get, I'll just say a couple of quick things. He's got lots of standard, really important titles. He's the Regents Professor and the McKnight uh, Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health at the University of Minnesota. What he really is, is the person the country turns to in critical moments um, when uh, things look scary and we don't really know what's going on. And that certainly happened uh, in the years after 2001 with the anthrax and with biosecurity really uh, coming to a head. And, and he's one of the foremost, if not the foremost, expert on these issues uh, for our nation. And so, as you might imagine, we were pretty thrilled when Mike agreed to uh, come and, and keynote this discussion. He has a recent book which has gotten wide acclaim called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And um, we are really excited and thrilled that Mike is here. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I should tell you what my kids call me, as opposed to some of the other titles. Um, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I have to kind of put this meeting into some perspective, and I had to reach back a ways to do that. A number of years ago, when I was a state epidemiologist in the Minnesota Department of Health, I had the dubious honor and sometimes horrendously horrible experience of having to testify before our state legislature on a number of different uh, activities. And one of the ones I had to talk about uh, was uh, a bill to eliminate the sale of domestic skunks in our state. We had over 80,000 skunks a year raised in game farms that were descented and then sent to pet stores, and we exported a fair amount of asymptomatic rabies. We hadn't yet had a human die, but nonetheless, it was just a matter of time. So I'm before this agricultural committee, basically telling why we have to get rid of this business, even though nobody's died yet. And as we got into the discussion, and I got beat up pretty badly by these agricultural oriented news, there was one state legislator who happened to be very well versed in the area of medicine. And at, uh, he finally was the last person to question me. And he said, so Dr. Ostrom, he said, you know, I, I just have one question for you. He said, you know, I've been following all that work you did with that toxic shock syndrome. And as some of you may know, our group was one of the ones that first discovered that issue in the fluid capacity. And I had just completed a study sampling 2,000 used tampons for Staph aureus bacteria. He said, you do a lot of work with used tampons. And he said, uh, you know, and I was very interested in that outbreak report you just had in the New England Journal of Medicine on the first foodborne outbreak of giardiasis in which we had 45 school teachers submit all their stool samples to our lab in Christmas wrappings during the Christmas holiday. We had unwrapped before we could test. And he said, now you're over here dealing with these skunks. He said, tell me, he said, is your career on the way up or the way down? <laughs> and I couldn't honestly tell him other than to say that I know today being here, it's a highlight in my career. So thank you for having me. Now, there's no way in my short period of time that I can cover the myriad of issues or topics that the last 40 years have given me some perspective on and relates to infectious diseases in the media. Let me just tell you that uh, it is without doubt uh, some reflection to think about. When I first started in this business, we were still using rotary phones and snail mail for rapid communication. Uh, today, obviously, that's changed and sure reflects what's going on. But let me, in the short time I have, really hit home four different bullet areas, I think, that are relevant to today and important for our discussion. One is there is a new reality. Second one, an epidemic, sort of. Third one, it's all perspective. And the fourth one is balls and strikes. The new reality, we've already heard about that uh, from our introductory comments, but we do live in a new reality with what we call information. And I use the word information because, in fact, it's much broader than news, but yet it often is interpreted as news. Fact-based public health and medicine no longer are the accepted persuader of the general public, our elected leaders. We have surrendered that. And we've surrendered it unwillingly, but at the same time, rather passively, because, in fact, today we are not a primary source in many instances where major decisions get made. Historically, there have been seven kinds of fake news delineated in the world of journalism. First is satire or parody, where no intention to cause harm, but always had the potential to fool. The second one is false connection, when headlines, visuals, or captions don't support the content and never were they intended to. The third one is misleading content, misleading content of information to frame an issue where I intentionally know that I am misleading the individual. 
The fourth one is false, con for false context. When genuine content is shared, but with a false contextual information, meaning that, yes, I saw this happen, but I'm trying to explain to you for all the wrong reasons why it happened. Third, imposter content. When genuine sources are impersonated with false made up sources, and today in a world of the internet where you can make any page look like it's the top left deck kind of page from a major media source, that's clearly one. Manipulated content, when genuine information or imagery is manipulated to deceive as with doctored photos. And finally, the last one is just fabricated content. When new content is 100% false, it's designed to deceive and do no harm. Those have been the seven accepted terms of fake news to date. But today, up to 30% of Americans and an unknown percentage of others living around the world believe that what they read, see, or hear is fake news. And the role that institutional news sources like the New York Times, the Washington Post, PBS, and Stat News play is very different. Because in fact now, they actually believe that there's an eighth category of fake news, and that is real fact-based news that they just don't like or want to believe. And so suddenly we have had a new category added literally within the last two to three years in a way that is beyond just vaccine hesitancy. It's beyond just the idea that raw milk is safe. It really is a contextual basis that they are telling me a lie. And it's all based on the best information we have. Now I can tell you from dealing with a lot of public policy, when 30% of your population or more may believe that, that creates some real challenges. We could talk all day about what is fake news today and what's happening. We know surely that Washington, D.C. has become a centerfold location for fake news, and anything that we don't like is now fake news. But how do we really begin to address this growing th threat of fake news to fact-based science and policy? And I will have to tell you right now, I don't care what ivory tower academic center you come from in the world, nobody has an answer. Really, we used to think education of itself was sufficient and necessary to change that. Today, we don't know. When you look at a world today of just four years ago, white supremacy, Black Lives Matters, Me Too, border children separated, I could go down the laundry list. Think about this, we have more states attorney general investigations into the Catholic Church and sexual misconduct than we do organized crime. Today's society is kind of a free fall of trying to understand what are the institutional areas that I can trust and how and why. And science has been put in with one of those categories I can't trust. And coming from the heartland, I can tell you it's alive and well. Number, point number two, an epidemic sort of. Who is a health journalist today? Can anybody define that for me? What, what training, what criteria, what degrees, what experience, what support system, what challenges, what criteria? What kind of qualifications does it take? I don't think we know. I used to know. I used to deal with health journalists all the time in many different venues of news, the standard news business, and you kind of knew who they were, and they were good. Who reports on health today? Well, it's whoever writes blogs or does videos. It's whoever has an avenue to get a piece of information out. And I say that because while we may not agree with that, the public does. The public sees it different than we do. They don't often distinguish between a trained, academically trained health journalist and a blogger with a cause that may or may not reflect science reality. They're just as pretty in terms of on the website. I went back, and because I deal a lot with media, and tried over the last several weeks to identify everyone I could that somehow claims a space in the health reporting area. And I came up with 82 different people in the United States, just in the US, who write about health issues in the just infectious disease space area. And basically, for me, it's a real epidemic. So on one hand, while we've had a constriction of what I would call the classically trained health journalist, we've had an explosion of people who self-identify as a sense health reporters or health information sharers, and the public does too. They, they buy into them. They take that blog writer with the same credibility they take somebody from the New York Times and maybe in some cases even more. Fewer than 25% of the 82 people that I identified would have any way, shape, or form but called by this group as a health journalist. 
Less, literally, almost a quarter is all. So in a sense, we really have an epidemic right now of health reporting, and the public doesn't in many cases understand who or what to believe. And we somehow have to begin to address that and take that back as our issue. Now, can we change it? No, I think it's, it's the train's already left the station. But as we go forward in the new age of information, we need to be aware of that. It's all in perspective, point number three. That which kills us versus that which hurts us versus that which concerns us versus that which basically scares us may all be very different. I deal with that every day. Having been very involved in the 2014-16 Ebola outbreak, I think that this is a good example of how do we represent population-based risk in our reporting today. What is it that from a health standpoint grabs people and sells papers or causes hits on a website versus what really is causing health conditions of consequence in our society? Let me just take Ebola. I, I having been very involved with that, and I'm very involved right now, I chair the World Health Organization R&D Roadmap Task Force on Ebola vaccine. And my job is yet to help get these vaccines licensed. And so I can tell you, sitting in the DRC, where we had to basically shut down all the activities three days ago because of this new wave of violence, pretty challenging. But let's just put this into perspective. In the 2014-16 Ebola outbreak, there was an estimated, we like precision here, but we know it's not that precise, 28,846 cases of Ebola, 11,223 deaths. A bad situation, considering the 24 outbreaks of Ebola prior to that time in recorded history had only 2,000 cases total. But what we missed from a journalistic and a science standpoint, what the hell else was going on? Several really well done studies with as much data as you could imagine estimated that there were probably 14,800 additional malaria deaths due to an absence of clinical treatment and bed net distribution because everything was diverted to Ebola. There were an estimated 2,000 to 16,000, I think the number probably is somewhere in the middle, additional measles deaths due to the 600 to 750,000 children that did not get their routine childhood immunizations for over a year. If you just add those two up alone, far exceeds the number of Ebola deaths. And we didn't hear about it. So I don't want to minimize the Ebola situation, but we have to strive harder, I think, to keep putting perspective to the issues of the health we deal with. And again, what scares us versus what hurts us versus what kills us versus what concerns us, all is a big mix. And we need hard to try to represent that. So the message is never forget what matters when it does kill us or hurt us, but we can't take our eye off the ball of what really is going on and what are the actions that we need to take. The final piece is I want to deal with is balls and strikes. Now, in a city like Boston, everybody's got to resonate with balls and strikes, right? When you're in Minnesota right now, not so much. <laughs> 15 games out just from the wild card. In August 4th, the New York Times had an article by Melinda Wiener Moyer, an experienced science and health writer and a contributing editor at Scientific American, who wrote a very thoughtful, even a very provocative piece entitled, Anti-vaccine activists have taken vaccine science hostage. This article caused a lot of consternation in a lot of circles. Basically, what Melinda did was actually address an issue that she had researched for over a year. And looking at an issue around influenza vaccine and how it was reported upon and what happened for those who had talked about it in the public. And I quote, she said, as a science journalist, I've written several articles to quell vaccine angst and encourage immunization. But lately, I've noticed that the cloud of fears surrounding vaccines is having another nefarious effect. It is eroding the integrity of vaccine science. We in science are afraid to address our own problems because if we do, they will become public. And if they become public, we only further basically distance that public from what we do. And yet at the same time, we are basically selling our souls by doing that because in the end, we will be held accountable for the balls and strikes. You can't have a different strike zone in every stadium you go to. We got to be held to the same accountability. In this same article, let me just share with you that Melinda provided a historic basis for this. In 2005, Loni Simonson was in with the NIAID at, at, at NIH 
and her colleagues published a study in JAMA, which showed that flu vaccine prevented many, many fewer deaths than expected over age 65. The response was loud and resounding from colleagues. What the hell are you doing, Loney? You're ruining everything. In 2011, our group published a paper in Lancet showing that we had grossly overestimated how well flu vaccines work because we hadn't understood that the studies that had been done from World War II until the age of PCR used serology as an endpoint. And it turned out that when you vaccinated people, they had an antibody rise, but if they actually got infected, they didn't have a fourfold rise. And that happened 80% of the time. You could show an influenza vaccine was 80% efficacious in those old studies when it was zero efficacy. And nobody picked that up till PCR. Well, we published this paper saying, you know, we need better flu vaccines because this is what's happening. They maybe work half the time and sometimes not even that well. The hate mail I received was remarkable. I was compared often to Andrew Wakefield and measles. And yet it was sound science. Today it's not even a debate. CDC has done wonderful studies showing, like last year, we're lucky if we get any efficacy for some of the strains. And if we get 30, 40% overall, that's really good. Well. Andrew Reed, the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at Penn State, actually wrote in this piece, science perception of public irrationality is having an impact on our ability to rationally discuss things that deserve discussion. Do you know how many people are afraid because they're going to get shot from the front and the back to talk about when we have challenges? But science should be a self-correcting art where basically we learn and then we learn what we don't know. And then we learn, and then we learn what we don't know. And pretty soon, just like somebody tacking, sailing out there in the harbor, you get to where you're going to by tacking here, tacking there. 2009, Danuta Skaronsky and colleagues in Canada, very, very well done study, showed a link between seasonal flu shots and actually an increased risk for pandemic flu. That if you had your shot in the year before, you actually had a higher risk of getting pandemic flu with a pandemic flu shot. Today, we have a better understanding of the immunology at the time Again, Dr. Skronsky went through many of the same challenges of really hate mail, not from the public, from our colleagues. Last September, researchers at the Vaccine Safety Data Link, a collaborative project between the CDC and a number of different healthcare organizations, published a study in the journal Vaccine that found an association, not a causal link, about miscarriages in the first trimester after having received H1N1 flu vaccine. And if you'd received H1N1 the year before as well as the next year, you had over a seven-fold increased risk in the first 30 days of a spontaneous abortion. Now, we know from a biology standpoint that for whatever reason, women are at increased risk for H1N1 and pregnancy-related outcomes and natural infection. We didn't know this at all. But the criticism of this paper, which, by the way, to the CDC's credit, was an incredibly well-done study, and it was one that has now actually been expanded and we'll have much more data in the next year as we're now looking at this and with much more statistical power. But there were a number of people who again just berated the fact that this study was done and that in fact that it ever was reported on. And while I surely don't take any uh, comfort here in naming anyone, but I think it's important because one of the things I've found happening is there are too many people by name who become gods of infectious disease information, whatever they say goes. In this case, Paul Offit, the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and a champion of childhood immunizations, was highly critical of this paper was ever published and basically said that in fact, it was a situation of cherry picked data and went on with all the same things I would have expected from the anti-vaccine group to have done if this was a pro-vaccine related outcome. I've watched this happen with increasing frequency, and the media just accepts it because it's somebody who has a name. Well, I'm telling you right now, you know, I deal with the media a lot. Don't ever give me a free pass. Never. And what we have to do today in this day of disinformation, fake news, we have to figure out in science how we're going to be self-correcting. And I think the discussions we're going to have here in the next day and a half, some of them are about self-correcting and how do we deal with that. So I urge that these be points that we consider and that we have to move on. The last paragraph of Melinda's piece, very thoughtful, was there's no question that bad vaccine science does not deserve a forum. And much of the research cited by anti-vaccine activists is very bad indeed. But good science needs to be heard from, even if some people will twist its meaning. 
One thing vaccine scientists and vaccine-weary parents have in common is a desire for the safest and most effective vaccines possible. But vaccines can't be refined if researchers ignore inconvenient data. Moreover, vaccine scientists will earn a lot more public trust and overcome a lot more unfounded fear if they choose transparency over censorship. Last year, I had that experience in spades. We had a large measles outbreak in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, particularly in our Somali population, where there, to our chagrin, the level of measles vaccination were lower than they actually were back in Somalia. And the one reason I could stand in front of the group and say with absolute certainty and complete scientific support and comfort that measles vaccine did not cause autism was because, in fact, they also knew that I stood up in front of that group and if there was a problem, I would have told them. It's that kind of credibility that allows you to then address many of the false notions. We have got to do more and better in the media with that. So in conclusion, let me just say, I don't obviously need to remind this group that we live in a new information reality, a new relationship between media and the public. And we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of sorting out. And this meeting like this is just an outstanding example of how we're trying to do that. Infectious diseases, public health, public perception, and public policy, and collectively uncharted territory. We're all there. And in this relationship, what we have historically called the media. Today, we need to understand what we really mean when we say the media. Now is the time for all of us, public and private institutions, and of course, the mainstream media to address where have we been in our journey with the media and information and contagion? Where are we at now and where are we going? If we think about the changes that have occurred in the last five years, I can't even imagine what the changes will be like in the next five years. And in the meantime, it will continue to be a world of infectious diseases. So I leave with one last hope, and that is that we do take this very seriously because as a father of two children and a very proud grandfather of five children, their lives depend on what we do. And we have to do it the right way, and I know we can do it better. Thank you very much. Okay, Josh. Yep. And before, let's like, maybe take five or ten minutes for questions. Before we do, I just want to reflect on your last set of points about science and how science has become captive to this issue and science as advocacy. And science as advocacy has become, I think, like a pernicious problem that has invaded all of the things. Um, and you know, my personal experience on this is a lot of what I have done is worked on uh, things related to the Affordable Care Act, just slightly politically um, uh, contentious. And uh, every single time I've had a paper that shows that some provision of the ACA is working well, I get cheered. And once I had a paper that showed that one of the provisions was probably doing more harm than good. And not only did I get I read that paper, by the way. Um, I got a phone call from a very close friend who was a senior official in the Obama White House who basically said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? And he said, which team are you on? And that was the moment that a light bulb, that I was supposed to be part of a team as opposed to being able to look at the data and say, guess what? The ACA is not perfect, and there are parts of it that are not working, and we ought to try to fix it as opposed to... So this is, this is I think, pervaded science. It certainly is in infectious disease, but it has gone well beyond that. This was not meant to be my soliloquy, so let me stop. Um, let's take questions from the audience for what was really a... Quick thing. Perfect. Can I comment on that? Please. First of all, thank you for the work you're doing. It's, you really are doing cutting-edge work, and I love reading your work, and I think it is very important. And, you know, this is also one of the areas that uh, I have had a fair amount of negative comment on in the last three to four months. Three months ago, I was appointed a science envoy for the State Department, one of five such individuals who, as an individual private citizen, represents American interests around the world. I have an upcoming trip to Indonesia and Malaysia, one to Ethiopia and Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. People said, how in the hell can you do this with all this fake news, et cetera, et cetera? And you know, I've had roles in the last five presidential administrations, and I have always considered myself a private in the public health army. And my job is to do the best job I can to help whoever is there. And I do not ascribe to any political view. I will not support non-science-based approaches, and I will be very vocal about that. But the bottom line is don't get disengaged, because if we do, we do surrender. We do basically say, okay, there's going to be one voice out there. 
And so don't think that I don't push back at the State Department on issues when I'm su suggested to me I have to take a certain position because I push back and I'm waiting one day to get fired so by somebody, okay? But until then, I'm gonna keep pushing back and I hope that academics in general don't give up like you're not, you know? Stay with it because this is really important to help keep us moving forward in that direction of truth. Monique. Hi, um, Mike, thank you for being uh, the private, the truth teller, the champion in public, public health and health security. Um, given the central role that you're playing with regard to the Ebola vaccine task force with WHO, can you say vaccines are one of the few pharmaceuticals we administer to healthy people? Um, what are you Could hearing? you put that a little closer so I'm hard to hear, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, vaccines are one of the few pharmaceuticals we administer to healthy people. Um, given this sort of barrage and the challenges in public health communications, what are you hearing from vaccine developers, uh, especially in a situation or a scenario like Ebola vaccine and the appeal or the challenges they're facing um, in, in this domain? Well, thank you, Monique. And to make sure I don't steal the thunder from tomorrow's series of discussions on vaccines, okay, and which I'm speaking on that very topic tomorrow. Uh, let me just say that uh, Again, a new world order is in order. Um, we want to believe that the private market and the private economy should bring these vaccines through. And to a certain degree, child immunizations works that way. When you have developed world countries that can buy them and then developing countries, uh, low and middle income countries, get them on discount. But for so many of the vaccines like Ebola, there is no business model to bring those through. And in fact, part of the roadmap work that we've done for uh, Ebola, Nipah, and loss of fever, there is no market. I mean, it's so minimal, you can't buy yourself into that even with government subsidy. And so one of the things we're gonna have to look at is a whole new model of procurement and support. You know, if missiles were basically only built by companies to sell in the private market sector, uh, surely there may be some purchases, unfortunately. <laughs> But it, it wouldn't substantiate what keeps the defense contractors in business. We have to understand that these vaccines are as critical, if not much more critical to the world. And we have to come up with a new model that says it is in the public interest to bring these through. So when you present to a company, invest $500 million to $700 million, we'll throw in another $200 million or $300 million. But in the end of the day, your take home is going to be, we'll buy $5 million worth of vaccine or $20 million worth of vaccine. You know, you don't have to be a... Uh, you know, an MBA from Harvard to understand that that's just, uh, that horse doesn't ride here. So I think that's, we, we need to relook at all this and that truly came through loud and clear. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I'm Scott Ratson. I'm a senior fellow at the Kennedy School and the Center for Business and Government, Mike. We've seen each other a time in the, in the, in the past. Uh, I've been editing the Journal of Health Communication now for 23 years and a big believer, obviously, in the, the kind of messages that you've been saying. So my, my question is, uh, on this whole vaccine piece, and you mentioned it quite well, the multi-sectoral efforts and the opportunities for different sectors where perhaps conflict of interest is left at the door for the bigger picture of vaccines, this concept of vaccine literacy had been put forward at Harvard a number of years ago, and now there's some researchers are bringing this of what's, what's happening in China and other places. How do you think vaccine literacy uh, might be a cornerstone both for not only, as you mentioned, the need for media to have a knowledge base, but also the, the general public. How, how do you think all of that might fit in the, in, the, in the way that we're dealing with issues of, of understanding that you well presented of routine vaccination, measles in this case, right, as you said, in, in, uh, in um, Africa versus, you know, these other uh, outbreaks and, and so-called everything that's of epidemic proportion these days? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, two answers. Your question is the billion, billion dollar question. You're right on the mark. Number two, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, I think this is where the challenges are right now. And we're trying to move this through. I mean, I, you know, I, I, again, I use flu as an example. We're working right now a lot on what some call universal flu vaccine. I hate that term because I don't need 18 hemagglutin types and 11 neuraminidase types in my flu vaccine to protect most human disease. So I call it game changing. But do you know what it costs to cannibalize the current egg production system? And what company is just gonna willingly turn that away and suddenly embrace this whole new situation, which if we're gonna actually pay for these new vaccines based on what it costs to get them, we're gonna basically be spending lots and lots of money to get a good flu vaccine. 
we have got to rethink all of that, and we're not. I mean, what we do is we approach it with another phase one or phase two study that looks great, but in the end, you know, and I'll say this tomorrow, you know, we got a lot of people buying wonderful five to 10 foot lengths of rope. They are really good ropes. But the problem is everybody's drowning 25 to 50 feet out. And so just because you have a great 20, you know, 10 foot rope, what have you got? And so we need a system that takes us exactly as you pointed out all the way through to the end. And what role vaccine hesitancy plays in stopping it, I don't know. But you know, there's an old oil frame commercial from many years ago. For most of you in this room, you're far too young to know it. But the old line was, you can pay me now or you'll pay me later. And I think that we're at that point right now with many of these global disease issues that we're paying just a hell of a lot more than we would have to if we paid up front to actually try to bring the technology to, to stopping these, and, and uh, I think that's really an important point. So thank you, that was a great question, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So thank